edition of the Heat Read Podcast. Today we're going to talk about heat reading services. And we have my good friend that runs one of the most successful uh, heat treat services business. He's a, a general contractor for uh, heat treat companies. And he's also CEO of one uh, rock and roll uh, management band. He's going to tell us about it. Mr. Kyle Favors, uh, one of the most uh, no, notable, notable individuals in the heat industry. But I just would like to say hi, Kyle. And, and thank you for doing this. I know you are on a busy schedule. How's it going? That's going great. Thanks for having me, Carlos. So you're basically on the California. Uh, no, I mean, you're in North Carolina, right? Or South okay. Carolina. You're South okay. Carolina. So uh, pretty much everybody in South Carolina that is related to heat treat, they know Kyle Favors, right? Sure. <laughs> yeah. So, so today we're going to talk about uh, heat treating services. Uh, Kyle is president and CEO of Heat Treat Services Unlimited. And uh, it's a company that uh, services uh, all the heat treat industry on calibrations, uh, upgrades, retrofits, rigging, installations. Whenever you don't have an expertise on the furnace side, you know, Kyle is one of the, the experts that comes to your plant and helps you out. So just, just for the audience, Kyle, if you could just give us a little background about who you are, what do you do, and how, uh, and how do you get involved into this industry? Uh, Kyle Favors uh, started in the industry back in uh, the mid 90s uh, at a commercial shop that uh, was doing controls work for them. I always played with uh, doing computers and things like that. So uh, I worked for Carolina Commercial for a few years, got into maintenance, uh, and then left there, went to a calibration company and ran their southeast division and uh, really kind of fell in love with the field service side of it. Um, worked for Marathon Monitors right before I started this company and uh, in May of 98 just took the leap and started uh, heat treating services in um, as a service company calibration and uh, consulting company and uh, my uh, Back in 02, we started CF Thermal, which is a manufacturing rep um, company, and we did consulting as well. And that's basically the two businesses that we have. And then, uh, as Carlos said, I've got the, the rock and roll label. Uh, we have uh, been doing that for 11 years, I guess. We've had. And, and the name of the rock and roll label is Thermal Entertainment. Yes, right. Thermal Entertainment. You know, you got to go with, go with what you know. So didn't know that that business. So I figured if I threw thermal on, I might understand it a little bit better. <laughs> um, I still don't understand it, but we're still doing it. Um, so yeah, so you know, basically my background is more controls and sales and services. Uh, pretty much uh, working on furnaces for my entire life. Just, you know, I was born into the industry. And everybody says that. Um, my dad's been in heat treating since uh, '78. I believe it was seven the eighties and steel mill before that. So as a as a small kid, I used to get the luxury of cleaning out clinch pits and, and all those wonderful things when uh, he'd bring me in for the weekend, you know, slave labor, child labor, whatever it is. Um, but it taught me a lot, and uh, that's kind of how I, I grew up in it. So it's, it's great. My dad was in the business with us for until about uh, about nine years ago, ten years ago maybe, and. Um, when he, he retired and he's had a consulting business and uh, he's pretty much retired all the way now. He's very happy with that and uh, just uh, enjoying life. So I was always lucky to have a, a good mentor um, on the maintenance side for sure. And, uh, I just love the, the entrepreneur side of the business. So I've always been uh, more into the sales since we started this business. It's, it's good. So basically, uh, Kyle makes his living out of uh, representing rock and roll bands, and his hobby is to retrofit furnaces, right? So that, that, that's a weird, way, a weird way to 
to see his life. Well, that's that's what I, I have seen him and I have talked to him about both both topics and, and he's very passionate about rock and roll and heat treating. Uh, so it, it, it's kind of funny, but today we're gonna just focus on the heat reading side. So, sorry guys, but you know, this is what we're gonna do. So Cal, uh, when we first uh, talked uh, about doing a podcast, I, I was thinking about uh, what, what, should we, what should we talk with Cal about, right? Because you do so much and, and so wide on the heat treat, uh, because you, you, uh, you do calibrations, uh, installations, service, upgrades, troubleshooting, consultancy. So you do, you do a bunch of uh, work and you, have, uh, you do work with uh, automotive companies, aerospace, I don't know, defense or energy or, or, or bearings. So you have a very wide vision of the heat treat industry. But uh, why those companies uh, hire your services? Well, because uh, when we talk about heat treat, Furnaces, and I would like to say atmosphere furnaces are very specialized. And they may have their maintenance crew, they may have a great maintenance team, they may have, you know, uh, great technicians, but for the entire plant, machining shop, presses, facilities, uh, you know, uh, furnaces as well. But when it comes to a furnace, you need to have a very skilled technician that understands combustions, refractory, mechanics, controlling atmospheres uh, on, on generators, and, and they know how to run the application and, trouble, uh, and troubleshoot things. So what can you tell those that the companies that are captive uh, or they're commercial, uh, they know how to heat treat, but they, they do not have the people or, or the experience to maintain their furnaces or troubleshoot it in, 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 if a, a situation comes in? Yeah, definitely the more years go by, the, the less experience it seems that plants have. Um, as people retire that's been doing this for you know, 40, 50 years, you know, they, they retire and, and there's young engineers that don't have the passion, I guess, um, in a lot of cases. And, and there's really great young uh, engineers out there that are you know, really setting some good standards for the industry now um, as far as PMs and, and maintaining equipment uptime, those those are critical pieces of the pie that happen today more so than they used to because it wasn't such a concentration. It was about making sure it ran and and getting the product out the door. So now it's safety, it's all those all those things that um, maybe were secondary are now to the forefront. But, but part of that is is the lack of the guy turning the wrench and, and breaking the furnace and, and troubleshooting the generator when you're not making the right gas and and giving that knowledge um, that knowledge is, is being passed down. Um, it's not sure that it's all translating. So our 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 goal is to to be there and be that uh, knowledge that they don't have. Either share it and it's in training or actually doing the performing the work. So I've got crews that go and, and they'll break a furnace and before they're done they're you know they PM the furnace. They all the things that that we bring to their attention that weren't necessarily as important now becomes something that they want to standardize on because they see the benefit of it. So there's I think it's a lot of education what we do. Yeah we fix a lot of things and we get it running and we get them out of trouble and um, but, but educating is a, is a huge part of service today for, for the guys with the knowledge. And you know, my goal is to make sure my guys are smarter than I am, and, and hopefully they are. Um, so that makes me look good. Uh, but that's that's, uh, that's really the goal is to make sure that all that translates down to everybody who works for us, and and then then in turn turn to these uh, to our customers. So that's one of the big benefits that we try to pass along to everyone. And it, it's uh, it definitely um, it's welcome when you're out right there. So when when you go to let's say an uh, uh, a greenfield company, a company that is just uh, starting operations or maybe starting the heat treat area, they get their furnaces from the OEM, right? Uh, they signed off the the project with the OEM, and then. Uh, the furnaces or the heat treat cell is responsibility of the of the of, of, of the company, right? They have to they, they, they have to have a heat treat manager or a maintenance manager or a metallurgist. I don't know. Uh, 
uh, but they're uh, newly hired, maybe with some experience, but uh, there's not that uh, history of technical skills. And they call you just to see how you can help them. What do they ask the most? Uh, what do you think they can focus? And what is their biggest lack on, on your experience when, when you're dealing with a, with, with a greenfield uh, operation? Uh, that they just purchase furnaces because uh, there was a switch of production and suddenly they decided to open a heat treat, but they need to start from scratch. What do you hear from them? I guess, I guess the, biggest, the, the, the biggest thing that we initially would get called for is to you know, verify uh, that the equipment is accurate enough to get signed off. Uh, so that's a piece of it. But the past that is, is maintaining this um, so PMs um, is probably the, the number one thing. But as soon as we start talking, they start realizing that that knowledge is, is very important. So you know, with the PMs, they, we always encourage and, and typically they do. They'll start putting a few of the maintenance people with us as we do those so they can educate them just on general maintenance. But it's typically PMs and, you know, having that, uh, that cell phones they can call in the middle of the night and things don't don't go right and uh the generator is not making the right gas so they can call somebody and they and so that we, we become a source for that for sure but it's it's definitely the, the pms and maintaining the equipment and spare parts are typically go back to the manufacturer and initially for sure and so it's uh maybe educating them on, on where what's important to maintain and what's not. So spare parts, you know, critical spare parts, is definitely a big part of that too. So, um, but the knowledge base is, is what they seem to get the most out of and, and want the most. Not realizing that when they first ask, it's like, can you maintain this room to the PM for? They, they realize that they have to have that outsourced because they don't have any general knowledge for their training. So like the, the, the big thing everybody wants to, uh do right on uh, heat treatment is preventive maintenance. You, you say that uh, those guys are uh, talking and talking about preventive maintenance, but uh, unfortunately, furnaces, they like to run 24 seven. And when there's a bunch of production, they're the bottleneck and no manager wants to uh, shut the furnace off when we have a bunch of production and we're making money and they decide just to skip the PM, right? What's your opinion on that? It's, it, it's, it, is PM, in your experience, well uh, scheduled and respected by companies, or if they just have a bunch of production, they just keep running parts? No, absolutely not respected. Critical, yes, respected, no. <laughs> when they're going to, you know, all businesses are going to make money, and, and if they're making money with that furnace, and you know, there's no issues, and you know, but it, it goes very, very much to the point of pay now or pay later. It's just a lot more expensive when you do it later because you didn't do the PMs. And so it's it, it absolutely production is king. That is absolutely the rule of every manufacturer. Um, so if they feel like they can't shut it down, everything's good. They're probably going to skip that PM and, and but at the end of the day, they're not getting to the next one and it breaks down. And it's not a small cost, it's a massive cost. Um, so that. So you, you're 100% right. It's it's uh it's overlooked. It's not it's it is not respected for sure. But it's critical that we put you in the I mean, we we spend uh, three days doing a mesh belt PM, uh, five if we're doing a total PM thing with tubes and, and all the elements, what whatever we're doing, changing all the things. We'll take, we'll take five days. When you don't do the PM and you go in the second year and, and you know now we're in there for 14 days because now we're breaking because of the carbon content with you know and pet and impregnating the brick and the brick starts to come out, the fans are going out with bearings and all those things that seem like it was a good decision to move on. PMs is, is a critical decision. It's now you're down two weeks and you spend a hundred thousand versus twenty thousand. And that I mean that's pretty much how uh, we try to we try to to push the PM strictly because of that. And if you're gonna pay now or pay later, paying later is always always. Mostly. 
Right. When they run the foreign steel failure, it's going to be, every, every, you know, everything's more expensive because every, everybody wants to go on a rush and pay like a premium and work uh, two ships, you name it. But, um, and, and, and what, because I do a lot of maintenance for the guys that don't know as well, you know, I'm, I'm like, I, like, I, like, I am like Mexican Kyle, but uh, <laughs> better, better looking. I'm still just kidding. But, but Kyle, uh, what's on your experience? There's a bunch of activities in maintenance wise. Uh, when we're dealing with a pusher that, that the company, uh, I mean, the customer can perform themselves, right? And there's other activities that is uh, better than an expert uh, or an outside company to do because it requires a higher level of skills. Which uh, preventive maintenance of uh, a company would you recommend a company to do themselves internally and what to outsource? I mean, would be, I, I'm pretty sure if, if you have a big maintenance and, and limited uh, people to do uh, a push a retrofit in a week or two, you prefer to have your guys do the complex stuff. But sometimes the scope comes with cleaning the stuff, uh, you know, debriefing the, you know, taking debriefs out or, you know, uh, putting, putting some, uh, let, let's say, bearings in and out that can be easily done by, by, by the customer. Uh, on, your, on your experience, what will save cost and time for the customer by doing themselves and what will they need to outsource? So, so we'll use the pushers example, and, and with that, I would say, you know, the maintenance, pull the, the fans, tubes, things like that. Um, I don't recommend for anybody that to pull out the brick as a savings. What that what that does, is you lose the ability. The guys that are bricking it lose the ability to see the failure points, see where you're having issues. Uh, you know, cr crack brick tells a story. And you can't fix that if, you, if it's not there to see it. So I always recommend that whoever's breaking it is the one carrying it out. Um, taking out fans, tubes, those things, you know, if they have a great maintenance uh, department to do that, then, then those are unbolting things, pulling them out. Again, you lose some of the ability to make the furnace better if you're, if you're rebuilding it by not seeing as as I come out, how it what the effect was of that being in the things. So I don't, you know, to pull it apart is is probably the the thing that most maintenance would do. Um, I know that we always say, well, we'll tear the brick out. Yeah, but you know the problem is I can't we can't fix it. We can put it back, but we can't make it better. And that's really the, the key. You know, so I wouldn't recommend that. Um, General maintenance is bearings and things like that. Absolutely, if, if they have manpower to do it, I mean, that's the biggest problem here. Is yes, and I, I, I was going to go there. You know, it's uh, the, the the secret is manpower, right? Yeah. And because uh, the furnaces like to break down uh, on couples or on, on different locations very far away at the same time, and yeah. and, and the key is manpower, right? And sometimes you. If uh, they can help you out with a couple of guys pulling stuff away, pulling stuff apart, and just cleaning stuff out, it, it makes the whole uh, difference, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. So, I, yeah, I would, I would, uh, anything that's that's critical to the design or or failure point, I would definitely source that versus uh, doing anything. But if they have manpower, then you know, it's certainly going to save them money. And uh, also uh, another uh, issue or challenge to consider is that uh, Forest has run 24-7 and some of the failures occurred in, you know, uh, maybe in the third ship or in the weekends, right? Uh, do, do companies have a maintenance crew 24-7 uh, or do you think that companies might just have like a maintenance guy from Nine to five. No maintenance guy works nine to five. <laughs> um, but they, uh, it really depends on the size. I mean, if you're, if you're looking at like a, a bearing facility, they're going to have three shifts and they're going to have a scaled down crew on the off shifts typically. You know, say if they have 40 guys, they're going to have 25, you know, 
10 and 5 on, on, on the three shifts just because um, basically the management, everybody else is not there to make those decisions and there's not as much on in some cases. Some plants have equal, but uh, take a commercial shop. Typically, a commercial shop would have one, uh, one shift of maintenance and then guys on call. You know, there's very few that have multiple shifts of maintenance you know, that are in my territory. So let me, let me ask you a question. If you were a general manager or a plant manager of a, a company that has a heat grid shop and not some other and, and some other machines, right? What will your ideal maintenance crew look like? You will have pipe fitter, two electricians, one 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 brick guy, or you will do outsource everything else. I mean, if you could co configure and choose the the people skills uh, that you will have uh, on your maintenance team, uh, what would you be ideal to to maintain a furnace line? Definitely uh, electromechanical guys that can, can do both, understand both. Um, Mill right for sure that, that can weld and, and fabricate. There's a lot of that when you're repairing furnaces. Um, an electrician, you know, the, the more like everything, everything is it's very involved with PLCs and, and controls. Um, the, as years continue to go by, they they get more sophisticated, and they, they're trying to outsmart the people that you know, trying to handle the things that the people normally would do, and that takes technology. So that so now you're looking at a higher end tech tech to handle the PLCs and, and that control side of things. Um, which still willing to do electrical in, in that type. So but you know, depending on the size of the crew, but you definitely need mill right, you definitely would need uh, electric mechanical, electrician would be ideal and somebody that understands and you can work on the control. So now I want to touch on a very delicate subject, which is safety and NFPA, right? Because it, it's very delicate, you know. Uh, so the, if you buy a brand new furnace uh, today uh, from from an OEM, uh, it's, it's, it's very probable that it's going to be very safe, that it's going to comply with all the NFPAs. But uh, there, there's very old furnaces still in the market that has been, that has been well maintained, uh, but uh, they're not safe anymore. Or, uh, or shops that have uh, improvised a way to keep the furnace running without upgrading it, and they fall into very big safety uh, faults, and uh, the furnace works, right? There's a potential risk, but the furnace works, they have a jumper, or they, they, uh, you know, they press the switch, or, or somehow they take away the, the, uh, the sensor, but what do you see when not dealing with a brand new company that just acquired a state-of-the-art heat treat line uh, against the ones that have run their furnaces for 40 years and there's potential risks? Um, well, I mean, we, there's a lot of those out there. There's a lot of those, and, and we, we barely talk about those. Yeah, there's probably more of those than there are the new state of the art, you know, up to, up to safety. Now I can say that th there is a drive to do take those older furnaces to the new to the new uh, standard. And um, there's several companies out there that do the NFPA. Typically, your insurance um, here would, would say that um, we want you doing safety checks once a year, and not everybody does them, but you know they they do require that. Now, here, there's a grandfather clause that people fall under. So if they're not up to the, the latest spec, then they would be able to say grandfather. The problem with grandfather is there's a very, it's a very tight word because anytime that you do anything, you upgrade control, let's consider an upgrade. Now you lose your grandfather clause. So you, you have, be careful with what you, you know, what you're quote unquote saving by not doing it. So you, you really have to, uh, any kind of upgrades, any kind of modifications to the equipment, that or relocating equipment across the aisle, you lose pretty much, technically, you lose that brand product clause. So, um, you know, I would say that anybody that's in that situation would be 
beneficial to buy a few components a month, do one one temper finish, one batch finish each each month, so you're not getting this massive hit. Because if you have one issue, and they come in, then it's, you know, it's a tremendous hit. So um, it's not it's not uh, hugely costly to to upgrade a gas train to the the latest and greatest, even if you're 25 year old things. So what would be like if, if you were to give an advice or a hint to a guy that doesn't know if his furnace is uh, safe or not? Uh, he might have a furnace, it might be running because uh, the furnace has always run that way. Uh, what would be like the ABC check just to know if that furnace is safe or not? So so there's, there is a checklist that pretty much you have to follow. It's, you know, you got your low high pressure switches, you have your Double safety valve, the door limit switches. Uh, you want to make sure the plane screen comes on. So that is that is the gospel, right? It's the FBA um, to tell you what you're supposed to do to, to keep this um, And it's basically a step step through checklist. You know, we do them as uh, we go through. We just check off. We open the door. Plane screen doesn't come on. Well, that, you know that's that's a hit, right? So. And we basically do the do a report card, which everybody should do internally if, if you don't have a source to do it for you. And just to make sure that everything is, is safe for your employees and yourself and you're protecting your investment. And now, now uh, t taking a, a, another approach to the ones that are too safe, then it comes uh, CQ9 and NACA compliance, which I am aware that you also are an expert, so you also supply the part of the scope. Uh, is there also a lack of people uh, on, on the industry uh, because CQ9 and NACA is a little more uh, recent, right? Right? Uh, than, than people that are skilled to uh, maintain furnaces? Uh, do, do you see that the companies also ask for a lot of training on? On not just for this operation, but you know, uh, quality and, and traceability. Is there is there that culture? What do you think is is, is easier to understand? Because when whenever you're dealing with a metallurgist, I mean, they're trained, they're educated on microstructure, right? But they have to learn furnace processing, uh, furnace mechanics. You know, the way the furnace is, is is processed, and as well to take care of the quality and traceability of the part. Do you, do, do you come across uh, some of that as well? We do. Um, so typically what we would do, um, we get a request to help us understand, you know, they're basically asking for help for understanding where they need, what they need to do to meet this specification. Um, you know, because when they read it, it is uh, like me reading Spanish. And, uh, you know, it, I don't comprehend what they're, what they're trying to say. So, by not understanding the equipment, you can't comprehend that stuff, right? So they basically drop it to layman's terms, and that that is the, something that we do on a regular basis, and it's a um, it become it is becoming more public for people to ask for the CQI on training and and AMS, and, and there's a tremendous amount of excellent training classes out there. I mean, just you know, fantastic people out there training for this. And it's online where it's you know available to to everyone. Um, but the hands-on us being there with them is basically uh, what they're asking for. Show us because we, we you can tell us they'll turn the gas valve on and we're going to say which one. They don't understand a lot of the equipment. So understanding the equipment is probably our biggest training. Um, okay, this you know this is your low pressure. This is your high pressure. And just really walking them through every piece of equipment uh, of the equipment so that they understand what it is so they can make sure to maintain it. And on, on your experience, uh, com companies tend uh, a, a little more uh, to have a quality guy running quality, uh, uh, metallurgist running the lab and uh, maybe another industrial engineer running the shop, or do you see a guy that runs quality shop maintenance? Uh, what's, what's, your, what's the common denominator 
on how a structure is uh, a commercial shop, which is basically run sometimes by the owner or, or a captive shop. Uh, who is the key team to have in order to have a successful heat treat, heat, heat treat company? Yeah, so if you've got a guy that's doing production quality around the lab, then, then he's probably in his 60s because it, I mean, that used to be a regular thing. It's, it's not anymore, right? So if you do have those key, key, per, key people. Typically, I see in smaller shops, you'll see a quality manager being also the lab manager. They might have a tech doing some of the you know, cutting samples and things like that, but um, you'll see that in a smaller shop. Uh, maintenance manager, same thing, right? So the maintenance manager, but he's also out there fixing things. And uh, when you're bigger ones, are the more you know, managers, and they, and they pretty much are hands off and they have people doing it. And, but really, the, the key to a heat treat is, is having your being in touch with it. You can't, it's hard to understand heat treat from day to day if you're not in touch with it. If you don't go out and touch that piece of equipment or walk around that piece of equipment or talk to those guys on the floor, it's tough for you to really understand what you're going to face tomorrow. You know, it is very, uh, you know, heat treat is, is, you know that, or else you're, you want to heat treat. So, it, Every day it changes, and you know, just because it looks the same doesn't mean it is the same. So it's really being in touch. And if you can get those guys out on the floor, um, that's that's the team. You know, the floor manager will go out there and really uh, put his hands on and, and at least the parts to the talking to the people and understanding where he's at, they know what's coming. So, so th thanks for sharing this, Kyle. And I know you took another approach to, to the industry. And, and you have a startup called Heat Treat Depot, which uh, is, is basically, uh, I call it the Heat Treat Amazon, right? So, so tell us a little bit about what you did there, uh, what do you saw the niche, and if, if you think that this industry, you know, running on captive shops and commercial shops and such on specialized equipment, very custom, is really to buy online stuff. So... So it's it's a outlet for us. It was always a vision to have this where you could we would have millions of dollars in parts available in for the for the 1960 surface furnace or AFC furnace or or whoever's furnace, right? Because we would have this 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 part so that when it breaks, you can actually get it. And that was always a vision and, and through the pandemic. You know, COVID last year, we were able to put that basically to, you know, make it live a little bit. And in some sense, it's grown. And, uh, you know, we've been, you know, I see a lot of, uh, we see a lot of activity. We've had, you know, thousand, thousand plus orders this year already. And so people are excited about buying stuff online. Um, but it's still, I mean, I'm out there all the time with customers. They're never going to get away from that because you can't get what I just said is walk that phone to them and understand their problems without being there. But for the little parts, the widgets, the, the things we need every day, um, you know, it's, it's a great source for that. And the hard to find parts, you know, I, I just talked to you uh, actually this morning, had a call from a uh, commercial shop and the generator is down uh, or on its last leg, needs a pump. And um, we're looking at 12 weeks with these lead times. And we had two of them. We bought both of them just so that we had a spare. Um, so that that is a you know, that's what we're here for. So that, that, that's a good it's a good market. It it's definitely not taking the place of people out there in, in helping, but it, it is a great source for people to go to and reference hard to find product or to even you know old inventory that you don't want. You know, we buy that too. So it's that's actually been been something where we've gotten a lot of our products. It's, it's actually buying it's been most shops that's had it sitting in a trailer for 10 years that's never going to use it. So um, it gives everybody an avenue to sell it and, and buy what they what they need. Yes, uh, what's your uh, takeaway on this? Because I, I know that you spend a lot of time with customers looking at their equipment, understanding them, uh, getting uh, making their relationship. And as you see the customers, their needs, the facility, 
the, the shape of the furnace, if it's well maintained or not well maintained, you understand what to sell to them, right? But uh, of course, technology is, is driving everything to be sold online. Do, and, and this is a question, uh, Howard, do you envision uh, companies in, in, in 10 years buying everything online without interaction, without um, just, just purchasing a part, but not having uh, like a expert telling the guys, no, this is not gonna work for you. This is not gonna fit, this is not gonna work because that's also a very big part of the added value on, 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 on hiring a consultant on, on, not, on an outside company from yours. I mean, they're gonna advise uh, what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. And in this uh, business that everything is so custom, uh, there's a bunch of upgrades, retrofit, changes on products um, that has to fit in, into the forms in order to work. Uh, do you think everything is gonna go uh, that way and we're going to see much and much less interaction uh, with humans and more uh, one one click buy on uh, on Hitler's first that will be fantastic for your business right but it, it's still very special so I, absolutely not I mean, it, this industry is too divine and, and too custom to for that Every, you know go online okay I need a new burner system it's, it's not going to you need people there. You need that knowledge, and there always be always be a close to that. What what I think is is the huge void. Just like in in we talk about heat treat knowledge, a lot of the a lot of the old, old heat treaters are retiring or gone, and so it seems to be a little bit less knowledge out there than it used to be, or it's more technology driven because of that. So where where the void also is is in knowing what where um, because they're basically an engineer is handing that off to purchasing purchasing is, you know typing on their computer and looking for that piece not having that relationship unless that unless that engineer says buy it from Kyle Favors or buy it from Carlos it's you know, they're going to go searching for it and that's where the benefit we see is there's a big void in knowledge of uh, purchasing agents you know, it's you know 20 years ago, I'm showing my age a little bit, 20 years ago, it was nothing for me to go sit down with the, with the person manager at, at, after I talked to the heat treatment and, and make that connection because they had to understand why they were buying from me versus somebody else. And that's not as much the case today. Now it's, you know, you meet with the heat treatment manager and you hope he tells her to buy it from you or him to buy it from you. And so I, that knowledge of in relationships with purchasing is, I think, is is lacks a little bit. So we have the ability to offer that when they type that in. So and then that's kind of where the e-commerce comes in. It's working well, and um, and that's who we see a lot. You know, we see a lot of purchase managers on our site. So that was kind of the the resource that they would have. As long as we can get to all those, then it'll be good. So, uh, yeah, so it works. So I think the void of, of knowledge and relationships, you can fill a little bit with e-commerce, you'll never fill custom fixtures and parts and furnace, you know, upgrades. You're never going to get that. Thank you so much, Kyle. It's been fantastic talking to you. Uh, as, as, as we spoke, I believe uh, right now, talent and manpower is one of the biggest challenges uh, the whole industry is facing. And that's why there's companies, uh, successful companies uh, like yours, right? Because uh, you actually uh, deliver that manpower when needed, right? That knowledge when needed. And uh, it's a 24 seven uh, job, right? And for this, I'd like to break down on Fridays, right before your dinner reservations, right? <laughs> I, I, I found that the hard way, right? But, uh, but this is the industry we're in. Somebody has to service it. And I believe you do it with passion. You love what you do as much as you love rock and roll. And, and I just like to say, uh, tell to the audience, I, I, uh, because I have known Kyle for many years, but I, Kyle doesn't have customers. He has friends, right? He builds a bunch of relationships, works, works through with them. And, and uh, I just would like to, to recognize that because I, I do respect that a lot, Kyle. And, um, 
And now we have come to the technical side of it, but uh, I, I like to finish the podcast with this last question on, on, on more on the human side, right? Because there's a bunch of knowledge on the heat treat industry that is, is starting to retire, right? That is starting to leave. And I, and I believe uh, the industry is not filling that gap with younger talent. I mean, pe people is not uh, eager to go and work on the heat facility. Uh, the, everybody wants to work on a desk with a, you know, on, a, on a computer. And like you say, the best way to understand this industry is walking the line, looking at the furnace repeatedly, uh, hearing the noises it makes, you know, looking at the flames, at the, you know, at, at the, at the analysis of gases, you know, and, and, and it's a fact that uh, the, the, the new generation is, is, is more attracted to, to, to sit down on a desk uh, looking at a computer all day long, you know. It's not like, it's, it's not wrong. I mean, but it's just another approach of generations, right? Absolutely. What will be an advice uh, you will give to the heat treaters to fill that, uh, that gap or that lack of experience that is starting to retire. That's a tough one. Um, I know, and you're, and you're a tough guy. That's what I'm asking you on this one. That's a tough one. It's, uh, you know, if you, if may, it might not be, I guess the, the thing is you got to find somebody with passion. So if you can take somebody with passion and, and have them and build them into what you need, uh, so if you have a guy floating the furnace and he does it with a smile, I mean that's that's different than ninety nine percent of them. Is so you know he should stand out in the crowd and then educate him, make him that guy that you know, he loves what he does. And I think it's going to take that. It's, it's not going to take just hiring a guy with a, with a, a mechanical degree or no work degree. I think it's going to it's going to be a lot of interacting and trying to get the the passion into the person because. It's it's a tough industry. I mean, you can go and, and work on a computer all day, or or run an e-commerce store, or what you know. However, it's a uh, it's tough to get a guy to go out and do 120 degrees every day and get black and, and love it. And we're, we're although it's probably strange, but we love that. But we do love that. Um, and heat tree is is a lot of it has to do with I mean, you have to love to be there. To, to really be good at it. And uh, so they got to find those people. They got to find those people that love to run furnaces and do maintenance or whatever and educate them and, and build them and, and take them up the ladder. That's, that's really what the industry is going to have to have. Kyle, thanks so much for your time and, sh and for sharing all your knowledge and passion for the industry uh, uh, with, with the audience. Uh, I just would like to thank you for that. You're a great friend. I believe you, you, you are very passionate. You are as passionate as you are with rock and roll with heat treat, so that's pretty good. Uh, hopefully we can talk about rock and roll in another podcast, but this is not like the right channel. And uh, thanks so much, Kyle. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, just, just would like to remind the audience that we're uploading weekly podcasts of, uh, on, the, on the heat treat podcast, right? With power players of the industry, such as Kyle Favors. Uh, subscribe to the channel. We're on LinkedIn, YouTube, Spotify, on the Heat Read Podcast. So we'll see you next week with another power player of the industry.